doing. I'm also excited to continue the series that we started a few weeks ago called Purple Kingdom. Anybody else excited about it? Yeah. Maybe not the most exciting message for everybody or series for everybody. Somebody said that they wished I would go back to talk about sex, sex in Corinth. So you already know that it's not the best topic for some people, okay? You know, we're talking about religion and politics, right? And so they say that we shouldn't talk about either of them. We're talking about both of them in the church. (laughs) And I know it's like a nerve-wracking time. I mean, this is so polarizing, man, politics are. And I just want us to get a better view of what we're to, to view and how we're to view politics in light of the kingdom of God. So we're really preoccupied with what is red or blue, and we argue over all of that. I want us to be more preoccupied with what is purple, which is what represents the kingdom of God. We're putting those two colors together, and we're saying we want to actually represent the king above all kings, the kingdom above all kingdoms, and that is the kingdom of heaven. And so that's what we're studying, the kingdom of heaven. We're relating it to the politics of our day, and that's okay. We're going to continue to do it because the Lord told me to. I try to get out of this series. I was trying to get out of it. I had it in my heart. I was like, really, God? Really? Like, are you sure? Have you guys ever been there with God? Like, you're double-checking God, triple-checking God. Like, that's what I did with this series. He said, yes, preach this. I said, okay, Lord. Amen. That's what this is all about. The kingdom of heaven is greater even than my own desires. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So we're going to continue the series today with a message entitled Dual Citizenship. Do I have anybody in this place that is, in a, that is a dual citizen of two countries? I have a couple people. One, two. Okay, a few here. I know that we have, it's an international church. We've got people from different nations and uh, somebody from the front row. It was actually my sister. She said, Tavia. Yes, my daughter actually, Tavia, our 12-year-old daughter, is a dual citizen. She was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Okay, while we were missionaries and we were serving God in that country. And so she was actually born in a hospital in English. It is called actually St. Joseph Hospital. And here's a couple pictures of you. This is the sign of the hospital. Uh, Casa do Saúde, São José. That's St. Joseph Hospital is what that means. And then this is her being born and her two doctors holding her up. And this is, this is how significant the culture of football or soccer is in Brazil. When Tavia came into the world, her doctor actually um, is a huge football fan, soccer fan. And this culture is so cemented in, in Brazil that each person has a team. And it's like you're devoted to this team and only that team. So help you God. All right. And so this doctor's team is called Flamengo. It's, a, it's a, like a state football team there in Rio de Janeiro. And so when Tavia came out, he was so serious about football and his team that he claimed Tavia part of his team. She's Flamengo. First thing he said to me, he doesn't tell me she's all right and she's good. She said, he says, Flamengo, Jonathan, Flamengo. And I was like, her name is Tavia, not Flamengo. I mean, what are you saying? You know, I have no idea what you're talking about. He was claiming her for, for his soccer team. Like, that's how strong the culture is. And so, Tavi's not only a dual citizen, she also belongs to the Flamingo Football Club <laughs> in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So, it's so funny, man. It's, like, hilarious that that is the case. I, I actually hold this very dear and near to my heart because uh, we were missionaries down there. This is something that Tavia can tell the whole world for the rest of her life. I was born in Brazil. Why? Because my parents were missionaries. That blesses my heart. They were down there just sharing the gospel with the world, and she gets to be a part of it for the rest of her life, and she could, she could hold dual citizenship as long as she wants. We'll talk about that here in a little bit, but it's really cool, and I want you guys just to understand this. As a Christian, you are also a dual citizen. Every Christian. So when I said, are you a dual, or anybody in here a dual citizen? All of us who are Christians could have actually raised our hand. We have a citizenship both in the country we are born in or even nationalized in. So some of y'all even be, might be multiple citizens, <laughs> more than dual. But you are either that because you were born into the United States or another country, but you are also born into the kingdom of heaven if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. All right, this is what Paul the Apostle talks about in the book of Philippians chapter three. And I'm gonna read verses 17 through 21. I'll give you a lot more context later on in the message. I'll even share many other verses outside of just these verses, but let's read verses 17 through 21. He says, brothers, join in imitating me. Now, before I read on, 
I want you guys to ask yourself a question. Can you say this about your Christianity? Can you tell people, even the way that you are handling politics, on your Facebook page, in your family gatherings, can you actually say right here, join in imitating me? Or is it a shame the way you handle it? Is it a shame the way you handle it? Is it something that you are proud of? Or is it something, and should be proud of, I should say, because some of us are proud of things we shouldn't be proud of. Is it something you should be proud of, the way you're handling politics or anything else in your Christianity? Can you say, join in imitating me? Follow me and my example is what he's saying. Keep your eyes on those, he says, who walk according to the example you have in us. He's saying this, there's some people worth following in their example and there's some that, you, that aren't. And I just want to relate this to the politics of our day. Are, are you somebody and how you handle politics, are you somebody worth following? Because your politics and the way you handle it is like Christ. The way you handle it is not divisive and, and mean-spirited or idolatrous. But the way you handle it is as a kingdom citizen would handle it. This is what he's saying, not just about politics or even, and some of it does have to do with politics. We'll get into that. He's talking about every area of his life. Follow me. Can you say that? Follow me as I follow Christ. Like church, that is your call to be an example in Christ. So much so you can tell others to follow me as I follow him. Oh, y'all thought it was just for the pastor. No, it's for you too, if you belong to Christ. And you need to be an example, and you should only keep your eyes on examples of the faith that are worth following. Verse 18, he goes on. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you with even tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. There are people that are around us as Christians that even call themselves Christians or around us as spiritual people that are actually not good examples. They're actually enemies of the cross of Christ. They're enemies of the cross in how they live and what they're doing. And he goes on to describe what they're doing in verse 19. They're uh, enemies of the cross of Christ. And in verse 19, their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. What do they obey? Their appetites. They're on the road to destruction because they haven't really bowed their knee to Jesus They are actually enemies of the cross because their God is their belly, their appetites, and they glory in their shame. I told you sometimes we're proud of the things we shouldn't be proud of. These are people that are not just like focused on God and his cross and and the way, the truth, and life, Christ. They're actually enemies of the cross. They glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things earthly things. Now he switches. There's a juxtaposition here. People that set their mind on earthly things compared to what he says now here in verse 20, but our citizenship, everybody say our citizenship. citizenship. He says is in heaven. I want you to repeat this. My citizenship citizenship is in heaven. heaven. (laughs) If you're a Christian, he's talking about you. So meaning I shouldn't just care about what the world just cares about. I shouldn't just mind only earthly things. I shouldn't just be consumed with what the world is consumed with. I'm a citizen of heaven, so I should be consumed with heavenly things. And from it, from heaven, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, or we could even say King Jesus, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power, look at this, that enables him even to subject all things to himself. In chapter 2, we learned that he is the name above all names, king of all kings. In Philippians chapter 2, we preached that the first message. He is the king of all kings, so everything is subject to him. He is given that power, all right? And so he has this ability because he is the king of heaven. He's the Lord of heaven. And if you're a part of that king, you're a part of this kingdom and whatever kingdom you've been born into. You're a citizen of the United States, but you're also a citizen of heaven. So since we have our citizenship in two places, how does all this work? How do these two worlds collide? What are our responsibilities to each kingdom? Where do we draw the line between one and the other? Let's talk about this. I'm going to give you three aspects of our dual citizenship today as we break down Philippians chapter 3. Number one, you are born into both citizenships. You are born into both citizenships. 
The reason why Tavia was able to be a dual citizen is because she was born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. But she also had parents that were born in the United States. So she was able to be a dual citizen that way. The same thing is true when I'm telling you, you are actually a kingdom citizen and or a citizen of this nation that you were born into. The way that you get born into the kingdom of heaven is you have to be born again. That's what the scripture says. If you're not born again, then you're just a citizen of this domain, earth. This world and what the world is all about, that's what you're about. But Paul is clearly rebuking some people because they're enemies of the cross because they've never been born again. They only mind earthly things. This is their life. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. Their glory is in their shame with mindset on earthly things. He's actually talking about what is often referred to as the Judaizers. They would come in. They were members of um, Israel. They were members of the Jewish faith. And they would come into the Christian circles and they would try to teach Christians that they have to obey the laws of Israel even as a Christian. And so they were preaching the law of Israel and they were mindful of what Israel did and they were mindful of the, the Jewish culture and they were mindful as people born into the Jewish kingdom. But these weren't people clearly that Paul says are born into the kingdom of God. And because of that, they couldn't see the kingdom of God. They were only mindful of their own um, citizenship in Israel. Now, I want you to understand this. This is why some people are enemies of the cross, even in our context in America. Many people have only been born into the U.S., so they only mind U.S. things, including when it comes to politics. This is why so many people put their hope in politics. Because they believe that whoever's going to win the election in that party is going to be their savior. It's going to be their way to have more rights and more peace and more prosperity. And they can have the American dream. Right? That's what we're taught. And so then if you've never been born again or if you've been deceived, you've been born again, but you've been deceived into the world and the environment that you are living in, that that is the answer to all of our world's problems or politics then we get preoccupied with just what is of politics, what is of the American dream, what is of being rich and famous and all these other things that the world teaches you. Why? Because if you've never been born again and your citizenship isn't in heaven, you're not ever going to think about heavenly things. You're just thinking about here and now. And this is what Jesus handled very clearly as he was talking to a religious leader of his day of the Jews who actually thought everything had to flow through this kingdom. And it, it really was going to through Jesus because he was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. But John 3, 3, it says this. Jesus answered him, this guy named Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the what? The kingdom of God. If you're gonna be able to see the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. You have to become a citizen of heaven. You have to have a new citizenship, a new birth certificate. Come on, somebody. You're never going to even see it. You're never going to be preoccupied with it. You're never going to think about it unless you're born again. This is what happened to Paul. Paul was born as a Jewish citizen, but he was born again as a kingdom citizen. He talks about it in this same chapter. Unlike these other people who were enemies of the cross, he fell in love with the cross because he was born again when he bowed his knee to the King Jesus. That's what happened. He was born again. And so he talks about this, these two different identities, his, his citizenship as a Jew, but also his citizenship as a member of the kingdom of heaven. He says this earlier in Philippians chapter 3. This is the context, and this is why I'm telling you about this Jewish identity. You find it more here in Philippians 3, verses 4 through 9. He says, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, his lineage, his citizenship as a Jew... He says, I have that also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, his earthly citizenship, I have more, he says. Look, he's giving his pedigree now, verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day, which was Jewish tradition, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Like this is who he rocked with, right? A Hebrew of Hebrews. That's the law, the Jewish law. He was a Pharisee. So it's also a political party of his day, a Pharisee, a leader of the Jewish law. As to, a ze as to zeal, he was a persecutor of the church. Like he was following what he thought was right under this Jewish law and Jewish tradition, his Jewish citizenship. He, he thought it was so right that he persecuted the church. 
This is how he was living before Christ. He says, as unto righteousness under the law, like following the Jewish law, I was blameless. Verse 7, but whatever gain I had and all of that, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. (laughs) For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. So he says, when he got born again, when he finally bowed his knee to Jesus, when he was knocked off his donkey and he was blinded and and he was witness to about Christ, he finally bowed his knee and all of his Jewish stuff and all of his lineage, all the things that he had prior valued so much, he said, compared to Christ, I count them as rubbish, trash. The King James, I know I was on the King James only people last week. It actually says dung. Y'all don't know what dung means because you don't even read the King James. Dung means poop. He said, I I look at it like that in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. His life was transformed when he met Christ. He got another citizenship. Yes, he was a Jew. And he honored even the Jewish religion of his day, but he had a new citizenship in heaven. When he was born again, Christ became his Lord, his King, and his Savior. And that has happened to any of us that have actually been born again as well. Jesus now has come on the throne of our life, and we have been made new. Do I have anybody who that has happened to? Come on, somebody. It happened to me. And I'm going to just tell you my story because like Paul, I grew up somewhere with my citizenship and my culture and I minded earthly things and my belly were my appetites, right? That's what I literally live for. I I was born into the MTV generation in the United States of America. Do I got any other millennials? Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. You come home and you'd watch TRL and Carson Daly and you were trying to watch the newest, coolest music videos and all that. Like, that's how I grew up. And I grew up in the dot-com boom, right, of the 90s where, you know, money and prosperity and everything was going going crazy as the internet was coming into very much uh, a common reality for all of us. And this was the life um, that I grew up in. And so I remember when I would come home, not only would I watch TRL, I would watch MTV Cribs. Anybody else know MTV Cribs? And this was all about kind of like experiencing the American dream. That if you're here in America, you can find prosperity and you can live and you can have the best of the best. Like your refrigerator could be dope. You know what I'm talking about? Like if you live in America, your refrigerator could be what's up. And so like they would come into the houses of all these rappers or whoever, these stars and these pop stars. They'd open up the refrigerator and they would show what they got in the refrigerator. And it was like so cool. And they would show their pools and their 10 cars and the ladies that would be hanging out in the pool. And I was like, that's what I want. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, that's the life I'm living for right here and right now. This is my dream. And so I remember just wanting to be rich and famous. I took a business class when I was in uh, high school and junior and senior year. And in this business class, like I was trying to learn how to make all the money. And so I remember they gave us the book, The Art of the Deal, from then just the businessman, Donald Trump. And I was like, yes. I watched Apprentice. I was trying to figure it all out. I wanted to be like him, rich and famous. Money, 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 money. You know what I mean? Like that's, that was my goal. And, and it was the environment that was influencing me. It was the people around me at school. Like, what do you want to do? Nobody just wanted to be a janitor. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> like, that's what I want to be, right, when I grow up. Like, we were trying to aim for, like, the most wealth that we could ever amount and the most fame and fortune. That's what we felt like would give us you know, some type of worth. And so that was my life. And so much so, you're going to see a picture on the screen right here where is, this is my senior picture from uh, high school. Look at this. (laughs) Yeah, dude, that's 18-year-old. 18-year-old Jonathan Ember. He's reading the Forbes magazine. Billionaires. Come on, somebody. I was trying to be on the billion flow. I was trying to be, you know, the next whatever, Bezos or whoever. And so, like, I'm reading Forbes magazine. I have around my neck a medal that I actually won by placing in nationals for the Business Professionals of America competition. 
So like, I'm for real, I'm trying to make all the money in the world. Like, this is where I was at right here in my life. And um, shortly after this picture, when I graduated from high school, my stepdad gave me a Bible and he gave me a couple messages. One was called Hell's Best Kept Secret, and I needed to know that. And one was called True and False Conversion. I grew up in the church. I was around the things of God. A lot of turmoil in my house growing up, but I didn't know the things of God, but I did not know God. My appetites were my belly. It was whatever I desired, that's what I lived for. I was living for the world. I was desiring the things of the world. And it's evident in that picture. It was evident in my life. I was an enemy of the cross of Christ. Why? My citizenship in America was all that I cared about. I had never been born again. I listened to those messages. I started reading the Bible. I repented of my sins. And shortly after that picture, there was a new citizenship that I was given. The things of this world began to fade away. I didn't care as much about all of the money. I said, Jesus, I'm here for you. Wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I'll do because now you're leading the show. You're calling the shots. I was born again. I could see for the first time. I could see how strong. Stupid! what I was living for really was. What would it profit me to gain the whole world and become a billionaire if I lost my life in hell for all of eternity? I bowed my knee to Jesus. I could finally see it. But the problem is many of us can't. All we can see is the environment sometimes we're living in. Even if you've been born again, you might have even been deceived that something in this world is going to satisfy you. Something in this world is going to actually be something that's going to give you, you know, true contentment. If that was the case, because this is what we say, live for the American dream. And this is what so much of the politics of our day are all about. Is just so we could actually just feed our belly. And I don't mean just with food. I mean just with all of our passions and desires. And they say, that's really what's going to make you happy. Happiness is on the ballot. Well, guess what? If just anything in this world can make us happy, why is it that people like Robin Williams has everything, still take their life. I want you to know you weren't made for anything in this world. You were made for the king, Jesus. You were made by him and you were made for him. And so today, if you're listening to me, I'm calling you to repent of your sins. I'm calling you to be born again. I'm calling you to actually have your eyes open to see what really matters. And here it is. It's Jesus and his kingdom. That's what matters most of all. This is the reason why I was able to leave the United States and go and be a missionary in Brazil and have a baby overseas. Why was I able to do that? Because I could finally see the kingdom of God as more important than the USA. That's it. And so you can't see that unless you're born again. And so today... If you've never been born again or you've just been deceived to think that something in this world is going to satisfy you, today I hope that you'll repent and say, Jesus, open my eyes, bow your knee to Jesus just like Paul did, just like I did, just like those who were baptized did, because that's when you'll start to live and see for the first time. So we're born into two citizenships, our nation and the kingdom of heaven if we're born again. Here's then the second aspect of dual citizenship that I want to preach. Each citizenship comes with certain duties. Each citizenship comes with certain duties. So let me make this very clear. Law, government, and citizenship of a nation aren't bad in and of themselves. Matter of fact, law and government, according to the scripture, we'll learn more about this in Romans 14, it says it's actually ordained by God. Like literal, civic government is ordained by God. So we recognize, just like Paul, that those things aren't bad enough themselves, but like Paul says in Philippians 3, knowing Christ is just far better. (laughs) Being a part of his kingdom is just far better. He loved his Jewish heritage. He would honor even the high priest. When he dishonored the high priest, he actually corrected himself. He said, actually, I shouldn't speak bad about my leader, because that's what the scripture actually says. I shouldn't speak bad about my leader. That's going to be another message for another day. I might have to extend this through November. Sorry for anybody. (laughs) His kingdom citizenship does matter more, but it didn't mean that his national citizenship didn't matter at all. Um, Just compared to everything else, it was rubbish. That's what he was saying. It's not rubbish in and of itself. Compared to Jesus, it's rubbish. 
Compared to Christ, it matters less, but it still matters. And Jesus actually spoke to this very thing. He spoke to this very thing. He answered the question, when do we yield to our governing nation, our our nation that we belong to on this earth, and when do we yield to our citizenship in heaven when he was asked about paying taxes? Yes, Jesus has something to say about paying taxes. And so in Matthew 22, Jesus said something, and it was revolutionary. So much so, it wowed people. They didn't have anything else to say. They just walked away. In Matthew 22, verses 20 through 22, he said to them, um, as they asked him about paying taxes, he held up a coin. He says, whose image in inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. Now, Caesar was the governing authority of that time. He was, the, he was kind of the king of the whole earth at this time. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. So he's saying that as a citizen of Rome, you have certain duties, and as a citizen of God and the kingdom of God, you have certain duties. You should do those certain duties. That dual citizenship comes with certain duties to both kingdoms. So we should do our civic duties and we should do our kingdom duties because we are dual citizens. So here's the bad news. Y'all got to pay your taxes. <laughs> Not just y'all. I should say, we have to pay our taxes. Come on, somebody. That should have got a groan out of all of us, man. Like, I feel like they take enough. Why are you going to tax me on my check, my house, and when I go out to get something to eat? I, I thought some of y'all would be with me. You know what I mean? Like, we don't want to pay our taxes, right? But as dual citizens, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Render unto God what is God's. Um, There was a local church just right here around the corner. It's actually the church my mom got saved at, the Baptist Temple. They actually decided that they were not going to render unto Caesar what was Caesar's. They actually did not pay their employees um, um, the employee tax. And guess what? Caesar came and took their church building, okay? If we are dual citizens, we have to do with our citizenship what is right under both kingdoms out of both nations and so for us i want you to understand you need to pay your taxes don't break the law come on be good be a good citizen take your civic duty seriously obey the law be good to our you know officials who are in office all that type of thing or are actually serving as police officers and and firemen and everybody else who are actually leading all of the politics like we're to be as good as citizens as we can be because we are citizens of the u.s But remember, you're also citizens of the kingdom of heaven. That comes with certain responsibilities as well. So the problem occurs only here when it comes to what Jesus is saying, when it comes to render unto Caesar what is Caesar and God what is God. The problem is when we reverse that statement. When we begin to render unto Caesar what is God's and we render unto God what is Caesar's. This happens when we make politics religion and religion politics. Let me say that again. We do the opposite of what Jesus said when he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, render unto God what is God. When we make politics religion and religion politics. These are two separate kingdoms and they need to be separate. All right. I'm not getting into separation of church and state, none of that. I'm just talking about being a part of the kingdom of heaven is different than any other nation, any other people group, any other king, any other president. It's just different. All right, and it needs to be different. It needs to be held in our heart as different. We need to do duties to both, but we actually get it twisted when we make politics religion like this. Um, I don't know if y'all heard, but this, this just gets me to the absolute core of my being. But have you guys heard of the Trump Bible? Okay. The Trump Bible has Trump's name on the Bible. And I'm not saying this because, again, I'm telling you not to vote for somebody or whatever. You guys know my heart, I hope, after you've listened. If you're a first-time guest, listen to the first two messages. But listen, he has a Bible, and there's the Declaration of Independence in the beginning of the Bible next to then the Holy Scriptures, as if they are one and of the same holy document. And I want you to understand Listen to me and listen to me very carefully. There is no document that compares to the Holy Scriptures. And there is no name on the Holy Scriptures that should be there 
that weren't first there by the writers that God inspired to actually write that book. So when it comes to my Bible, leave the name of Trump off of it and leave every other document off of it. I want the word of God and that pure and undefiled and holy because that's what it is. Okay, so vote for Trump if that's the way you feel led by the Holy Spirit to vote. But leave God and leave the Declaration of Independence and any other document that is not equal to Scripture, which is none, out of it. Come on, somebody. That's it. This makes Christians look wacky, dude. Like, we, like, like Trump is on the same level as God? Come on. Like the scriptures are on the same level as the Declaration of Independence. I love America and I love our Declaration of Independence and I've traveled to 20 plus nations of the earth and we have something special here, all right? But the kingdom of heaven and God and his word is still so much more holy and special than anything of this world. So don't taint it, don't mess with it, don't put anybody else's name on it. Don't marry anything else to it. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Vote for him if you want. But don't play it like this. Don't put them on the same. Don't put this stuff together. This is what we're doing when we are opposite of what Jesus said. We're making politics religion. I said this last week. We make idols out of this stuff. We got to stop it. Let King Jesus be our primary focus. Let him be the name we're known for. Let this be the example we show the world that we are more for Jesus than we are any politician or party. But this also happens when you hear pastors, and this is the other side of it, when we make religion politics, when we actually equate who you vote for with your spirituality. That you're not a Christian if you vote for the other party that I'm voting for. What? I thought we were saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves or anything we could do, including who we vote for. I thought that's how we get into the kingdom. (laughs) <laughs> like, is, is, did, did Jesus qualify if you belong to this party, if you're a Pharisee, right? Did he say any of that? Did he say if you're a Roman citizen then? No, it's if you're a citizen of heaven. How do you become a citizen of heaven? You bow your knee to Jesus. <laughs> so if somebody votes for a party different than you and they still name the name of Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they're a brother or sister in Christ. And they should be treated as such. And if you don't treat them as such, you have made your religion politics. Religion speaks to politics. It really does. There's a lot of stuff right now that the Bible will speak to in our day. Religion will speak to politics, but my religion isn't politics. Where the church has got messed up throughout the centuries. We have 2,000 years of church history. And where it gets most messed up is when it becomes most political. When the church gets so messed up is when we hitch ourselves to the parties of men. Even to the apostles. Like some claim Peter. Some claim Paul. Some claim Apollos. Paul said, listen, did I die for you? Did I die for, did, did, did. Mm. y'all, we belong to one name that is above every other name. Let's not make this thing politics because it's not. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, but render unto God what is God's. I want you to understand that his kingdom is so much higher, which leads me to the third aspect of our dual citizenship. One citizenship surpasses the other. I might even say one citizen trumps, but then I'd get too political. One citizenship surpasses the other. I I use surpass on purpose. All right. Philippians 3, 20 through 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, not a president, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power. Here's the power he's been given that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Remember, we read about this in Philippians 2. He was given the name above all names that even Trump will bow to. Come on, even Kamala will bow to. He's he's the name above all names because he's been given that power by his father through everything he went through, through his death, burial, and resurrection. 
So, so he is the name above all names. That means that our citizenship in heaven trumps every bit of our citizenship here on earth. And so I want to say this, civil disobedience, that means disobedience to the laws of our land. Civil disobedience is permitted when the two citizenships collide and your country's citizenship is calling you to compromise your kingdom citizenship. Listen to this. This is what I mean, that one surpasses the other. Civil disobedience is when I disobey the governing authorities, and I'm doing that out of religious freedom. Civil disobedience is permitted when the two citizenships collide. Your country's citizenship is calling you to compromise your kingdom citizenship, so you have to choose. Are you going to obey God, or are you going to obey man? I want you to know the context of Philippians, the book of Philippians. Paul is actually writing this letter while he's in prison. And he's actually chained to a guard. Why is he chained to a guard in prison? Because he believed in obeying God more than Caesar. He believed in obeying God more than the high priest. When Jesus was revealed to him that he was the king of kings and lord of lords, the only name given among men whereby we must be saved, Paul said, okay, I have a king that is higher than the high priest. I have a king that is higher than Caesar. And so he went about preaching the good news of the kingdom, that Jesus actually came to die for your sins. He was buried. He rose again from the dead, and he sits on the throne in heaven. Are you going to submit your life to him? That's what he would preach everywhere. Would you let, allow him to wash away your sins? He would preach it everywhere. Well, some places didn't want to hear it, just like they don't want to hear it today. So was he going to obey God, or was he going to obey man? Was he going to obey his kingdom duties? Or was he going to just fall in line with what the nation or any other nation was telling him? At some point, uh, we have to choose. What citizenship are we going to obey? Tavia will have this collision of her citizenships, like I said, when she is 18. She's going to have to go back down to Brazil if she wants to keep her citizenship. And she's going to have to do some things. And she's going to have some decisions to make at 18. And, and she's going to have to decide through doing a few things if she wants that dual citizenship to remain. And I just want you to know, as kingdom citizens, there will be plenty of moments where we're going to have to choose our citizenship in heaven over the citizenship of the United States or any other nation for that matter. Why? Because that surpasses other nations. The more godless the United States gets, I want you to think about this. Our, our nation is, I'm not just talking about how it's governed, I'm talking about its people. We're becoming more secular, more godless. And as a result of that, the laws are reflecting that, and they will reflect that more. And so I want you to think about it. The more godless the U.S. gets, the more we're going to have to make this same decision that Paul is making here, that the apostles made in Acts 5.29. Peter and the other apostles were called into question under the Jewish leadership, and they said, we must obey God rather than men. There will be more, there's going to be more of a time, and I'm just here to, I'm not trying to alarm anybody, I'm just telling you the truth. Everybody who lives godly in Christ will suffer persecution. That's our lot. Why? Because the kingdoms of this world, they don't like Jesus. They don't want Jesus. Not all of them. Right? They want their dark. They want their belly to be God. They want the things of this world to be God. And so this is this is the clash. And sometimes it will come to ahead. It will come to this clash. And so what decision are we going to make when that happens? What happens if it becomes illegal to gather for church? Are we going to obey God or man? What happens if it becomes illegal to preach biblical sexuality and gender because it's considered hate speech? Am I going to preach and obey God or man? What if it becomes illegal to share the gospel with people like it was in Paul's day in some places? Am I going to obey God or man? I'm here today to preach this, that we got to obey God. Why? Because his kingdom, it surpasses any other kingdom. And if he tells me to do something, I'm obeying him, not Caesar. I'm obeying him, not president. I'm obeying him. Only when that clashes. If it doesn't clash, I'm to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Even if, it, even if it's not an immoral thing, it's just something I disagree with, like how much tax I pay. 
That's not an immoral thing, although some of us could claim it's immoral. They're stealing a lot from us. Again, this is actually why policy matters. This is why actually who you vote for actually matters. Right, as a, as a citizen of the United States. Let me just say this, by the way. Our, our voting and doing our civic duty matters because you're voting for people who are going to enact policies that either are going to affect you or your children or your children's children. So voting does matter, and who we vote for matters because they might be actually promoting things that might be better for the kingdom or better for religious freedom or whatever than others. And so it does matter. But I'm just saying, even if, even if everything goes to hell in a handbasket, even if I get persecuted for my faith in America, I'm still going to follow Jesus. I'm going to submit to God rather than men because his kingdom surpasses any other kingdom. Let me finish the message with this example from um, the book of Daniel and Daniel himself. So Daniel actually served and had favor. He, He and the other children of Israel were in captivity in Babylon, another world dominating power like Rome. And they were there. And they were there um, in exile for a season. And Daniel gained favor, so he's actually in the king's courts under multiple leaderships. And he's there, and um, he's serving God. And he's trying to be faithful to God in Babylon, which is all of our call, is to be faithful to God in whatever nation we're in. And so he's there, but because he had so much favor, some of the guys didn't like him. And so they're trying to persecute him. Why? Because all who live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. So they go and they say, King Darius, why don't you make it a law that anybody who prays to any other God other than you, now isn't this interesting that politicians, even all the way back then, still wanted to look, be viewed as God? No wonder why still people are viewing them as God today. And they actually like it. That's another message. But this is what happens because he likes that and he felt good about that. He said, okay, anybody who prays to anybody else but King Darius, they're going to be thrown into the lion's den. This is what Daniel does. And this is the type of, of unction, this is the type of inspiration I want in the church. This is why we need revival. Is Daniel doesn't even blink an eye. Daniel does. The Bible says Daniel did exactly what he had been doing. He went to the same place that he was used to praying. He opened up his windows. He didn't even keep it closed. He turned himself towards Jerusalem and he prayed like he was always praying. Come on, somebody. This is this is a word. This is a word. Because I don't believe, we're, we're about to move into a time, in my opinion, where this is going to actually be the, the case in America, where, like, there is going to be persecution coming our way. And here's the deal. If you ain't used to praying and submitting to God now, you ain't got no hope then. <laughs> So you better get used to really praying and seeking God and bowing your knee to Jesus now because if you don't battle him now, you ain't going to battle him then when your head is on the line, when you're threatened to be thrown into the lion's den, when your family's threatened, where your 501c3 status is threatened. Come on, I'm going to bow to God whether they take away our tax rights or not as the church. Why? Because I'm a part of a kingdom that surpasses anything else. So I ain't going to shut my mouth. I'm going to preach. I'm going to do it in love, but I'm going to preach. I told you I didn't want to preach a series, but I got to preach it anyway. Because Jesus told me to. And I bow to him. And this is what Daniel does. He prays the same way he had been praying with the doors open. He ain't even hiding himself in praying. He said, I don't care who sees it. My God's going to take care of me. Even if they throw me in the lion's den and I die, I'm going to a better place than Babylon. Come on, somebody. They throw him in the lion's den. And the same God that he had been meeting with met him right there in the lion's den and saved him, shut the lion's mouth. I'm here to call out a holy boldness in the people of God. It's not time for us to be quiet about our faith. It's time to lift up the name above all names. Let's raise up a standard. Let's raise up Jesus. Let's lift him up. Let's bow to him and him only. Let's serve him. Let's glorify him. Let's magnify him. Let's let him be lifted up. Because all things are subject to him anyway. All things are subject to him anyway. We are dual citizens, but one citizenship surpasses the other. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you just consider what the Holy Spirit is saying to you?
Thanks for joining us for worship today. I'm John Collier, and I hope today has inspired you to love God and to love others more. We always wanna take some time at the end to pray for you, especially if this is the first time of believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Father, forgive us of our sins. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross and raise again so that he can be king and we don't have to be. Help us to learn more about you so we can live more like you. <laughs> we want you to connect with us and we want to connect with you. You can comment down below or go to diversitychurch.net and we'll see you again next week.